Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Dan Ashley, co-anchor of ABC7 News in San Francisco and board member of the Commonwealth Club and proud to be your moderator for today. Thank you for joining us. We're delighted to have you with us. We would like to thank the club's Humanities Forum and the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event. We are terribly grateful for their support. And we have a terrific program that I know you'll be fascinated by today. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Mark Updegrove, President and CEO of the Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation and author of Incomparable Grace, JFK in the Presidency. Uh, just a terrific read. I finished it a couple of days ago and it's just a wonderful book. And we're going to discuss uh, what's in this book and everything surrounding the JFK legacy here in the next hour. Mark is the president uh, is the presidential historian for ABC News and throughout his career has interviewed seven U.S. presidents. And so he is well familiar with uh, the legacy of the American president. His new book offers a compelling look at President Kennedy's brief, but certainly uh, impactful and transformative tenure in the White House. We will discuss a lot today uh, what's in the book and uh, some other issues around the book. And I encourage you, please, if you have questions to submit them in the Zoom chat uh, on YouTube, because I'd love to ask Mark some of your questions as well. Uh, Mark, welcome. Thanks so much for being with us today. Dan, thanks so much for having me. Delights, it's uh, delightful to be here. Well, um, we're thrilled to have you. You've interviewed seven U.S. presidents. I, 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 ha I would be dishonest. I've only interviewed one sitting president. So. <laughs> I have six more to go before I get you. Uh, but what a terrific experience that was. Let me start with, first of all, congratulations on your work uh, and also on this terrific book. Just wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think I'll start with, with this, Mark. All these years after his death, President Kennedy still retains this uh, mystique, uh, this rock star-like quality and, and fascination uh, not just in America, but in a lot of ways in other parts of the world, too. Why is that? You know, I think there are two reasons, Dan. One is uh, JFK was a fascination for folks in his time. He captivated the American people and, and uh, folks around the world, given the elegant image that he cast. He was debonair and charming and witty. Uh, he was he had, uh, incredibly eloquent. Uh, and there was sort of an elegance that we hadn't seen from a president before. And I, I think we were swept up by, by JFK at the time. I'm sure we'll talk about this, but it, it bears mentioning that he was only elected by two tenths of a percentage point. That, that if not for two tenths of one percentage point, uh, J John F. Kennedy would not have been president. Richard Nixon, the incumbent vice president, would have defeated him. So it was a very narrow victory. Uh, as he said, the... The, uh, the, the, the margin is thin, but the responsibility is clear. And he began to engender, I think, the fascination of the American public in his time. And he cuts a dashing f figure in history. Again, handsome, eloquent, uh, elegant, all those things a a in addition to his soaring rhetoric. So we continue to see images of him and see speeches from him. And those continue to be ke uh, compelling to this day because history in its most cursory form is often a beauty contest. And if you look at our presidents, John F. Kennedy is gonna be up there on, on the beauty scale. The other thing is he's cut down in his prime. Uh, he is just 46 years old. He's standing unparalleled on the world stage at that time. So it's easy to look at him and, and think about what might have been if John F. Kennedy had continued in the presidency. And I think there was a, the Camelot myth was spun by Jacqueline Kennedy and Kennedy acolytes after his death, which made him even bigger posthumously mm -hmm. than he was in life. It's, uh, as you and I talked before we started, it's almost like uh, 
a Jim Morrison or a Jimi Hendrix, a rock star who dies in his prime sort of takes on a whole new life later on. Uh, and there's a mythology that grows around them. He's similar in that respect. I wonder if he that would have been the case had he not been assassinated, had he just served a term or two terms, would we still be as fascinated with a John F. Kennedy? No, <laughs> I don't think so. You know, I think he would still do pretty well in history. It depends on what would happen in those years. I think that it, it goes almost without saying that he would have been reelected in 1964. He was so gargantuanly popular uh, in 1963 when he was assassinated. It's hard to think of anything that could have uh, resulted in an election loss the following year. But I, as, as you mentioned, I've interviewed seven presidents and uh, three of them have been two termers and, and all of those presidents, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush and Barack Obama would say those last two years of, of the eight years that they served are really tough years. People get real tired of you. The press is sick of you. The American public is sick of you and folks are ready to move on. And I think that probably would have been the case with John F. Kennedy, too. He would have been that much older, too. He wouldn't sure. cast as, as elegant a figure in the presidency. And we know from looking at photographs of presidents, they age in office. So uh, Kennedy dies at a time when we are most apt to remember him fondly, I think. Well, and you're, that's a great point, Mark. He, was, he died really uh, almost just three years after being elected. He was still the same person in terms of how he looked and appeared. He still seemed vital and vigorous, and we were still... Uh, fascinated with him. And when you look at some of the old, uh, and we're going to show some pictures here in a minute that, that you've used, and, and I'll ask you to comment on why you like these so much. But when you look at old video of he and Jackie Kennedy, you know, there is this elegance. There's this Hollywood meets royal family meets uh, upper class uh, of the United States. He moved gracefully. He carried himself in a way that was very dignified. Uh, he was different in that respect. And he also came of age at the beginning of the television era, really. That's exactly right. Uh, there's a chapter in the book called The Antithesis of a Politician, because uh, that's how JFK describes himself. I am the antithesis of a politician. And he talks about his, his maternal grandfather, Honey Fitz, who was the, the very colorful mayor of Boston, who was the kind of baby kissing, name knowing, back slapping politician that is the archetype. And John F. Kennedy was not that. John F. Kennedy was very cerebral. He was very cool. But he also said that he fit the age. He knew that it was the television age and that that image that he cast would be a tremendous advantage. And indeed it was. We know now that but for the televised debates between him and Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon would have been president. Those debates really showed uh, John F. Kennedy in, in, in all his elegance and all his, his eloquence versus a Richard Nixon, a very pasty-faced, five o'clock shadowed Richard Nixon. That power Who, who refused image. to wear makeup that night. He was offered who refused makeup to wear makeup. didn't wear makeup. That's exactly right. And because John F. Kennedy understood the power of television, great politicians master the mediums of their times. Uh, Thomas Jefferson did it with partisan newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham Lincoln did with, it, it, with the, the fledgling art of photography, used photography in his campaign. Franklin Roosevelt did it with radio. Donald Trump did it with Twitter. But John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan really did it with television. They knew that television was the dominant medium of their times, and they learned how to master it. Mark, let's talk a little bit about when uh, JFK first came to power, took office. He was really relatively inexperienced and, and was criticized for that and didn't have a great deal of uh, a depth of experience to draw from. And he, he, as you point out, he barely won the election. It was a, a very close uh, election. Did he come into office with as much enthusiasm and as excitement as he later began to have? Or was it a slow start? You know, in terms of popular approval, it was a pretty a fast ramp up from that very thin margin uh, that gets him the presidency in November of, of 1960 and him taking office on January 20th, 1961. We, we now know, uh, we, we can quote that speech, most of us, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. After that speech, 63% of Americans thought of something that they could do personally mm -hmm. to benefit their country. Americans started rallying around their young president. They were swept up in John F. Kennedy as they got to know him better. 
And it, it says something, Dan, that when he stubs his toe in a major way in worldview with the Bay of Pigs quagmire, just several months into his presidency, his approval rating among the American people is 83%. That's the highest it would be during the course of his presidency. Only 5% of Americans after that fiasco disapproved of the performance of John F. Kennedy. And I think that there are two reasons for that. Number one, we were at the, the high point of the Cold War where we were battling for hearts and minds across the world against the Soviet Union. Uh, and I think we saw the need to support our president at that time. But the other part of it is we believed in him. We saw what he was capable of, particularly with that, that soaring rhetoric that I talked about earlier. We wanted to rally around his vision. So that says a, a whole lot about John F. Kennedy. It's funny, he, as I relate in the book, uh, after his inauguration, he creeps back to the White House in the wee hours of January 21st, uh, 1961, to, to sleep in the White House for the first time. And the presidential bedroom is being renovated. So he sleeps in the Lincoln bedroom in the Lincoln bed, the massive Lincoln bed. And a reporter asks him the next day what it was like to, to sleep in the, in the Lincoln bed. And he says, I just jumped in and hung on. Uh, and that's really a metaphor right. for, for JFK in the initial days of his presidency. As you suggested, Dan, he's callow, uh, not particularly experienced. He's out of his depth to a certain degree in the office, but he jumps in and he hangs on. Well, that's a good, uh, that's a great story, and he he was a little out of his depth, and he was tested early on, and had some early failures. You mentioned the Bay of Pigs. Uh, talk about, and you write about this in the book. Uh, talk about uh, how those failures shaped him fairly rapidly. Well, he he has the Bay of Pigs in April of 1961, just several months after taking the presidency, and then uh, uh, two months later, he meets with Nikita Khrushchev, his Soviet counterpart in Vienna. This is at a time when superpower summits were like heavyweight championship bouts. The, the eyes of the world are on them. And they're looking at every move, everything is scrutinized. And JFK goes up against the very pugnacious and truculent Khrushchev, uh, and people have high expectations, and Kennedy does not deliver. By his own admission, in an off the record interview he has with uh, Scotty Reston, the reporter for the New York Times, he says he was savaged. And so that emboldens Khrushchev, and Kennedy knows it. Kennedy knows that Khrushchev thinks he's weak and is gonna exploit it to his advantage, to Khrushchev's advantage. And then we get, of course, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we'll talk about in a moment. But I think those early months shaped him. Number one, he didn't take anything for granted. I think uh, one of the things he sees with the Bay of Pigs is to keep the military, the very jingoistic, uh, military with its instinctive reaction to engage militarily at a distance. Uh, he learns to keep his own counsel and he is resolved to do better. After the Bay of Pigs, he has a press conference and he says, a great idea has many fathers, but a bad idea is an orphan. But at the end of the day, I stood by this bad idea and the responsibility is mine. And he, he resolves to do better and ultimately he does. Uh, Mark, let's talk very quickly about the Khrushchev summit. Was that a failure of of strength of personality, as much as anything else? He certainly had a command of the facts and 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 of the information, but somehow he did come across uh, as as the weaker person. Was that just yeah. a, 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 an inabil inability to sort of dominate the meeting? I, Dan, I think that's exactly. He, he let uh, Khrushchev dominate the agenda. Khrushchev kept on making it about the superiority of the Soviet system. And he ran over uh, Kennedy at every time. The charming debonair Kennedy thought he could charm Nikita Khrushchev, and he didn't. He was simply run over by Khrushchev. And people could see it in the meeting. Uh, you could see Khrushchev was like a pit bull. Uh, right. And Kennedy did not, uh, did not respond accordingly. I think uh, we see this with Vladimir Putin today. The, the Russian people respond to strongmen. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of strongmen in the history of, of Russia. We had, you know, all the greats, Alexander the Great and Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. And we had Joseph Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev, and now we have Vladimir Putin. And they will try to run over you. Strength is their, their lead attribute. And, uh, and Kennedy did not respond to that yeah. well. And that aggression, and, and you mentioned a, a, an impressive list of strong leaders in Russia. And then there is Gorbachev, and I'm reminded of a 
uh, a great story, and I can't remember his age name, who tells this story when uh, President Reagan met him, I believe at Yalta for a conference, and it was freezing cold, and uh, uh, Gorbachev gets out of the limousine to, to move up the stairs, and he's huddled in these heavy coats, uh, clothes, scarves, and a heavy overcoat, and Reagan comes out of the top of the stairs just in a business suit, no coat, sort of standing over him, you know, aggressively shaking his hand, and, and the, the aide to uh, Gorbachev, I think, wrote that he, he knew in a moment we lost that meeting because the, the, the contrast was so powerful. And in an age where images tell the story sometimes, uh, that was a very different type of encounter than Kennedy had with Khrushchev. Well, that's exactly right. And, and, and the reason that Reagan won at least the first round of that summit meeting with Gorbachev is because it looked like it was Reagan's meeting and that Khrushchev right. was a guest. So Reagan came out and he wasn't, as you said, he was not wearing uh, an overcoat or a scarf. He was in a business suit and it looked like the meeting was his and the agenda was his. And that's exactly why Khrushchev won, but, but for a very different uh, approach. It was this very pugnacious, truculent approach, approach that, uh, that caught uh, Kennedy right between the eyes. Yeah. Khrushchev always kind of looked mean. I mean, he looked like a tough guy. He didn't look like a warm and fuzzy or charming person. Um, and let's move forward from that uh, to, to some of those early challenges and missteps uh, to some of the uh, lofty moments that he had that that really defined his presidency, uh, calling for us to go to the moon by, uh, you know, in, in a decade. Of course, he said, I remember, in a decade, as I think he a decade, yeah. In a decade. The Boston uh, brogue. Very Boston, yeah, very, very much so. You know, he had also had some great triumphs, too. Yeah, he did. And, and as I quote Clement Attlee in the book, Clement Attlee was the successor in the prime ministership of Great Britain to, to Winston Churchill. And he said of Churchill's gift for oratory during the Second World War, great, uh, words at great moments can be deeds. And Kennedy doesn't have a lot um, of legislative accomplishments. For instance, Lyndon Johnson, his successor, has a slew of legislative victories that he can claim as, as being a, a rightful part of his legacy. Kennedy doesn't have many of those, but those words that he uses at key moments of his presidency are effectively deeds. And there are several examples of that. I talked about the ask not um, uh, quote that we, we all know, which is almost sure. an eternal expression of American ideals, this notion of reaching beyond ourselves or something bigger than ourselves and doing something for the country we love. You mentioned, Dan, going to the moon. This is at a time when we were far behind the Soviet Union in the space race. There was no certainty that we would leapfrog the Soviets as we ended up doing. And John F. Kennedy says to the American people, we will send a man to the moon and return him safely to earth by the end of the decade. That is a bold promise. And then a year later, he goes to Rice University here in Texas and says, we choose to go to the moon. And he makes it this uniquely American proposition. He says that we'll do it in the same manner that Lewis and Clark explored this country and that Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic. He, he made this a part of the American spirit. So all Americans could, could rally around that vision of what it meant for our country uh, to do this enormous feat. And then of course, there's elevating civil rights to a moral cause. Uh, until 1963, Kennedy had largely reacted to the civil rights movement, ensuring that the, the, those on the front lines of the movement were protected, but not doing anything to elevate the cause until he makes a very uh, important and eloquent speech in 1963 and calls the civil rights movement a moral issue. That, that changes everything. In fact, Martin Luther King, who's watching it, says, that white boy just hit it out of the park. <laughs> well, and he certainly did. But interestingly, from what I uh, read over the years, he, he as you, and you allude to it and talk about it in the book, he, he was a little late to that party. I mean, he, he, he was uh, sort of convinced or needed to be convinced to take a more bold stand. Am I correct? That's exactly right. Martin Luther King kept on pushing and pushing. The American people... Uh, didn't see the urgency, uh, the, most of the American people, uh, that there's a marked exception in the African-American community, but the bulk of the American people in polling did not see the urgency of civil rights. They didn't see that it, it was an important issue. Uh, 
uh, and, and Kennedy didn't either. One of the things that he was concerned about, I mentioned this was the height of the Cold War. Kennedy wanted to be a great foreign policy president. He believed great presidents were marked by their, uh, their, their successful foreign policy. Uh, so he more or less put domestic policy on the back burner. And it was at a time when we were just trying to show our moral superiority to the world, that we had the better system, not the Soviets. So exposing the world to the rabid injustices, racial injustices that we had in this country was not serving John F. Kennedy well on the world stage. He wanted to quell that. He wanted to keep that quiet while he battled the Soviet Union for, for, for moral superiority. So he really kept it on the back burner until he was forced to finally address it because of the continuing momentum of the civil rights movement, which exposed Americans increasingly to what was effectively racial apartheid. Mark, once he, once he did really join that fight in earnest, uh, what has your research told you about how he, he then embraced it? Well, I, I, he, uh, what happens, Dan, is that, as, as you know from reading the book, there's the campaign in Birmingham that many right. of us can summon images from that very bloody, very brutal civil rights campaign, the, the weaponized fire hoses, the, the uh, German shepherds lunging at young children who are protesting for civil rights, young, young students uh, uh, of, of color. So it's, it, these, these are brutal images. Uh, I think finally, John F. Kennedy has had enough when George Wallace, the segregationist governor of Alabama, stands in the doorhouse of an administrative building at the University of Alabama to prevent integration of that institution. And uh, he's about to, and, and the, those images are broadcast on television. Kennedy decides to, to get ahead of this thing. And he goes on television, uh, decides several hours before going on that he's gonna make this speech. Ted Sorensen, his speechwriter doesn't have time to craft a good speech. But Bobby Kennedy tells, Kennedy tells his brother, speak from the heart. Mm. So about two thirds of that speech is extemporaneous. And Kennedy simply expressing his feelings about what it would be like to be a person of color at a time when racial injustice was systemic. And, uh, he, and it captivates the American people. I'm sorry. It, it, no, no, I'm sorry, Mark. And it does, and you write about that. And, and it, it occurred to me at, as I read through this, that's a risky thing to do at that time to to sort of ad lib or, or speak extemporaneously on such a hot button issue. It was really a quite courageous in a lot of ways. It's amazing, and 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 I think think we really see Kennedy's heart around civil rights at that moment. That said, uh, he goes on to dissuade uh, civil rights leaders from staging the March on Washington, which would happen in August of 1963, and he doesn't put much will or muscle into the Civil Rights Act that he introduces in 1963. That is eventually shoved through Congress, in, in part due to the martyrdom of John F. Kennedy by Lyndon Johnson a year later. Yeah, well, and while you're talk we're talking about Lyndon Johnson, and this, again, for people just joining us, Incomparable Grace is the book, JFK in the Presidency, by Mark Updegrove, our guest here today. It's really a great read. Um, I, I'm gonna ask you a, about uh, the relationship with LBJ in just a moment, but, but while I have a moment, let's, I wanna show a couple of the pictures sure. uh, from the book that, that mean something to you. And one of the things, you know, we're both, well, I am certainly a video guy, right? On television news, we rely on video, but I've always felt that there's nothing more powerful than a still image to tell a story and to capture a moment. You know, some of the images that we see uh, are better as still images than they would be video images. They just, it's a moment in time. Let's take a look if we can at, at uh, a couple of these uh, images. And I'd like you to comment on why they resonate so much with you and what they say about this president. Well, this is the very vivacious Kennedy clan. Not only did, uh, did John F. Kennedy capture the imagination of the American people, so did the Kennedy family, in particular, Jackie Kennedy his very glamorous and elegant wife, who you mentioned before, Dan, but also Robert Kennedy and, and his wife, Ethel, and their, you know, their many children. They had nine children when John F. Kennedy was in the presidency. Uh, young Teddy Kennedy would become a senator from Massachusetts at the young age of 31. Uh, we, we started talking in, the, in the, uh, uh, the news business about Kennedyism at that time. There was so much 
that was dominated by the Kennedys, and it looked like they were a political dynasty that would be here for generations, that Jack Kennedy might pass off the presidency to Bobby Kennedy, who would pass it on to Ted. It was almost like this was royalty, and you can see from this photograph why they were so captivating. They're, they're just so photogenic and so lively and vivacious. And you know what's interesting as I look at that photo, you, you're lively and vivacious and and uh, affluent and almost regal looking. And you look at someone like a popular president before him, like Dwight D. Eisenhower, who's really much more of a man of the people. Certainly Kennedy was in terms of his reputation, but not the way he was raised or grew up. He was really quite an elitist in terms of his background, but yet somehow he connected. Yeah, that's right. But 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 it, one of the things, the Kennedys are our royalty, or they were right. for, for many, many years, our royalty, partly because of that that, that wealth, you know, the, the privilege there too, I, I think adds to their allure in, in certain respects. But there's an informality about them too. If you look at this photograph, they're not standing with their spouses. They're all scattered around. There's sort of this uh, American informality about them that we relate to as well. They're, they're the ones tossing footballs on the lawn. They're, there's there's a, um, an athleticism about them, a liveliness about them that's not stayed, that's not uh, royalty as we might know it from England or some European country. Yeah, that's true. They, they uh, I mean, those those touch football games and uh, those images and the sailing and everything else right. uh, it, it sent a message of, of vitality and, and recreation and and uh, very much being alive and being uh, and, and celebrating life. Let's it talk was a called, little. It was called vigor, Dan, at the time. Vigor, and yeah. vigor <laughs> that's and, a better and, word. And, and Kennedy would call it vigor. With Vigor, his, with his right. Boston accent, but it was vigor. They were vigorous, Vigor. exactly. Yeah, yeah, they were vigorous. That is the word. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, let's, you, we mentioned LBJ, who, of course, uh, was sworn in a few days after Kennedy's assassination. Uh, the relationship between the two of them was was rather interesting. You write about it. Uh, uh, you know, Kennedy narrowly defeated uh, LBJ in the primary. Talk a little bit about that relationship. Uh, bef bef once he selected him as a running mate, what was that? Why did he select him? Obviously, for political reasons. And and what was that relationship like? And how did that how did that help LBJ after his assassination? You know, the reasons that John F. Kennedy selects uh, Lyndon Johnson as his vice president is is that uh, well, there are two. One is he needs balance. He needs Southern balance on the ticket. Right. He is from Boston. He's sort of this considered this northeastern liberal, and he needs a bona fide southerner uh, to to round out the ticket. Lyndon Johnson from from Texas fits the bill. But more importantly, Lyndon Johnson understood power instinctively. He understood Washington. He understood the legislative process. He understood the people around Washington and under the Capitol dome. And I think he Kennedy felt that he was uh, an appropriate successor should something happen to him. It's a complicated relationship. There's the, the, there's a, the, uh, uh, the, the Kennedys are not monolithic. They all have different relationships with Lyndon Johnson. Joe Kennedy, the Kennedy patriarch, had enormous respect for Lyndon Johnson. In fact, he tells his son not to take the second spot on the, the Democratic uh, ticket in 1956 unless Lyndon Johnson tops the ticket as the presidential nominee. Uh, and he even uh, uh, offers to fund the campaign if Lyndon Johnson runs. So Joe Kennedy is an advocate for putting Lyndon Johnson on the ticket. Bobby Kennedy despised yeah. Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> and that contempt was more than returned in, in kind by Lyndon Johnson. They were just fundamentally different people. Jack was that Kennedy, a strictly, the, Mark, was that strictly a personality clash or was it beyond that? Because I know they really did not like each other. I think it was a principally a, a, a personality clash. I, I think, you know, LBJ believed, and rightfully so, that uh, RFK would not have been the attorney general, but for bold-faced nepotism, and that's certainly true. It's John F. Kennedy appointed his own brother to the attorney generalship, and that's a, that's a remarkable circumstance. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're just very different temperamentally. Bobby has sort of had this cross-armed detachment, this New England distance that he holds everybody on. And, and Lyndon Johnson is is as hot as the Texas sun. <laughs> you know, he's there's this legendary Johnson treatment where he presses your flesh and towers over you. And the, the, it, uh, Bobby Kennedy considers him uncouth. And they, they're just, they're, there's this major clash between the two. They would never like each other. Jack Kennedy, however, 
I think, had great respect for Lyndon Johnson. And as grudging as it may have been at times, uh, LBJ had respect for Jack Kennedy. Too. Did they work together reasonably well to the extent they needed to? Yeah, you know, we, we mentioned the, the race to the moon. It is Lyndon Johnson who digs in and helps to get our space program on track and tells Kennedy that it is possible for the United States to reach the moon by the end of the decade. He does that. He works on civil rights very carefully. But at the same time, uh, Bobby Kennedy is his brother's closest advisor in the presidency. And Kennedy tries to do his very best to keep LBJ out of the White House and reasonably successfully. We have to remember, too, that the vice presidency was a far weaker office mm -hmm. at another stage in our history. It really, Walter Mondale, under the presidency of Jimmy Carter, changes the role of vice president. So it was a far weaker role when Lyndon Johnson had it. it there was... Uh, that was, it was, we were living in a very different time back then. The media was different. The way it treated the president uh, and, and politicians was different. Um, would, uh, would John F. Kennedy be as successful today as he was then? Would he navigate this modern era as a president more effectively? Scandals might have stuck to him in a way that they didn't back then. I think you're question. absolutely right. You know, you're right. But given the way that we scrutinize our president, his womanizing would almost certainly be a factor. Uh, John F. Kennedy would have been aware of that. My, my guess is would have tamped it down in order to have a successful po political career. But his health problems too caused a major issue. He wasn't forthcoming about having Addison's disease, mm -hmm. about the drug regimen that was a daily part of his life. He took, if you look at the, the drug regimen, which was typical for, Linda, for, for, for John F. Kennedy, it is absolutely staggering. I've, I've enumerated it in my book, and you can't believe how, much, how many drugs he was taking at any given time. So those two things. The other thing that I think is the big difference, Dan, and you're in this business, is the media landscape has grown far more fragmented. It is, is, we, we have so many more media properties than we ever did. Uh, at that time, we had ABC, CBS, and NBC. Those were the only networks. Uh, we had just a, a handful of newspapers, one or two in any given city, maybe three at tops. So there were there were far less uh, uh, you know media properties around. They were far more centristly oriented. Uh, so I think that's the big difference. You have echo chambers today, and it's easy to vilify either a Republican or a Democrat depending on what echo chamber you happen to be in. So for, I mean, look at Walter Cronkite was the most trusted man of America right. in America shortly after the Kennedy presidency. You wouldn't have that today. It's too divisive a political climate. But I think Kennedy would play well in terms of image. Again, he is so eloquent. And I think that uh, words, no matter what uh, uh, our political landscape uh, looks like, matter. Words matter. And particularly on social media, for instance, if there are clips of John F. Kennedy making a, an inspiring speech, that would continue to resound today just as it did 60 years ago. You know, great leaders, great presidents uh, give great speeches, don't they? I mean, they're great orators. They know how to uh, move us and inspire us. And, and you know, the, the, the speeches that you detail in the book, that they're all indelibly uh, in our memories uh, even to this day, when I see those clips, I'm moved. It's fascinating. I mean, he, he, he was, he did cut an inspiring figure. Yeah, which is why, as to, to go back to the question you asked early in the interview, Dan, why he holds up so well in history. Those clips still resonate. Uh, they still inspire us. Uh, they still impact us in a way that they did at the time. And, and that helps to uh, to, to JFK to continue to carve out uh, an outsized legacy. Mark, what what would you identify as his greatest accomplishment? You know, it. I, I think it's probably resolving the Cuban mis, uh, missile crisis uh, without nuclear war ensuing. Uh, those were an excruciatingly tense 13 days in October. Uh, we talked about Nikita Khrushchev being emboldened uh, by Kennedy. He saw Kennedy, particularly after their summit, as being too intelligent and too weak. By too intelligent, he means that he saw, it means he saw Kennedy as an effete Ivy Leaguer who right. was brain smart, but not street smart. He not wasn't street. strong. Uh, 
and he could be taken advantage of. And, and that's when the Soviet Union starts shipping nuclear missiles to Cuba, just 90 miles from American shores. Uh, and so that becomes uh, uh, something that we, is absolutely untenable for the Kennedy administration. And we come very close to nuclear war. This is at a time, mind, when the bulk of Americans believe that there will be a nuclear war in their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And some of us are old enough to remember the, the duck and cover drills that we did in class in the event of a nuclear war, where we would get under our desks and protect our heads. People were building uh, backyard bomb shelters in the event of a nuclear war. So that's the closest, perhaps, uh, that was the, 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 the Cuban Missile Crisis was perhaps the, perhaps the most dangerous moment in humankind because we were so close to a nuclear exchange with the Soviet, the Soviets. But John F. Kennedy is determined to avoid military engagement in that most desperate hour. He remains cool and collected. He keeps all of his options open and eventually is able to settle uh, an agreement with Khrushchev that we didn't know about until much later. It looks like a zero sum victory for the United States, which what we learned later is that the, the uh, Soviets relented. They withdrew their missiles from Cuba in exchange for our taking nuclear missiles out of Turkey, which is in the Soviet Union's backyard and dangerously close to their border. Well, and and uh, you're right. I mean, it was we allowed Khrushchev to win or to, to claim some kind of victory in, in, in making that decision, I guess, to his people. Uh, I, I think we don't we didn't realize at the time people how just how close we really did come potentially to a nuclear conflict you write a lot about this what did what have you learned that maybe we didn't know before in your research about the cuban missile crisis about how kennedy uh, responded and and what those moments were like you know i i think i talked to hugh Sidey. hugh Sidey was the great president watcher for time magazine he had covered every president from dwight eisenhower through uh george w bush and he talked about going in to see Kennedy during the most desperate hours of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and how reflective Kennedy was. Kennedy was determined not to have a nuclear war because I think he understood the tenuousness of American uh, of, of, of life. Mm -hmm. He had seen his brother die in World War II, his brother Joe, uh, the eldest son of Joe and, and Rose Kennedy. Uh, his sister died shortly after the war. He almost died himself uh, from uh, uh, various illnesses that he had during the course of his youth. Uh, and he is desperate to try to avoid nuclear war because he knows what it will mean. But he uses the, uh, the stature he has in resolving the Cuban Missile Crisis peacefully to accomplish his, his I think, his proudest deed as, as president, which is to get the nuclear test ban treaty signed by the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. That is a remarkable accomplishment by, by John F. Kennedy. But, but Hugh talked about those desperate hours to me and he, he hadn't talked about it before. In fact, he and the president go skinny dipping at one point in the White House pool. Hugh says, the president says, let's go swimming. And you said, well, Mr. President, I didn't bring a bathing suit. He said, you don't need one. And they <laughs> splash around the White House pool. It says so much about Kennedy that during yeah. this hour, he's he goes skinny dipping in the, in the White House pool to relieve stress. But again, he talks about the seriousness of the issue and how determined he is to resolve it peacefully. Yeah, it's hard for any of us to imagine the kind of pressure he must have been under in those moments. I mean, it just, it's uh, awe-inspiring, really. You, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, and you do talk about it, I, um, the mystique that surrounds JFK. There's, there was enormous mystique around Jackie O and them as a couple, but the relationship had this public perception, but it was a complicated relationship. It was partly because of the womanizing that was a, just a, a routine part of Jack Kennedy's life. It's, and you can't escape that. Uh, John F. Kennedy's, the, the, the major blemish on his character is his reckless womanizing, including the objectification of a, a young 19 year old White House intern, Mimi Beardsley. We all remember the, the scandal that, uh, that President Clinton got himself into with Monica Lewinsky. Well, there, it wasn't a scandal. It, it, it would have been had it been exposed, but John F. Kennedy was having an affair uh, with a young 19-year-old uh, intern who, um, who loses her virginity to Kennedy in her first week on the job. And he, 
takes her around in his travels and holds her up in a, in a hotel room, almost like a concubine, when he wants to have sexual tryst. That's, that, that, is, that, that kind of behavior is hard to ignore and a major, major blemish on John F. Kennedy's character. And certainly that would torpedo uh, him today, that kind of behavior. You could, if, if, if it were to be reported back then, it would have as well, I suppose. But why was he so reckless in this regard? I mean, this was a real character flaw, uh, as you point out. It, it's a character flaw, it's a weakness, and, and it, it, it sort of defies logic that he would be so reckless. You know, I think his, his father was uh, also a pretty reckless womanizer and a pretty open womanizer. It was well known in the Kennedy household that he was having affairs. He would go away for long periods of time to Hollywood, where he uh, was one of the founders of RKO Studios. He lived with Gloria Swanson when he was there, and that was a pretty open relationship. But for the Kennedys, this testosterone just testosterone uh, infused family, at least the, the men, um, womanizing was almost a way of keeping score and competing with one another. Mm. We know how competitive the Kennedy family was and that that's, that's uh, um, spilled over into their womanizing. You know, they would almost uh, you know, compare notes about the, the women they had as a, as a point of braggadocia. So uh, that said, I will say, Dan, as I do in the book, that the relationship between Jack and Jacqueline Kennedy, we see that wonderful picture of them in the diner uh, that, that, that I see on screen right now. Um, their, their relationship got stronger through the course of John F. Kennedy's presidency. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy called it her happiest years. Mm. In August of 1963, the two of them lose their third child, Patrick, who dies just uh, a little more than a day after being born. Uh, and Jack Kennedy goes up to Cape Cod where uh, Jacqueline Kennedy has given birth to the child. And uh, John F. Kennedy sees that child die practically in his arms with the child's fingers wrapped around his own index finger. And uh, I think that binds, that, 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 that uh, episode, a tragic episode in the lives of the Kennedys, bind them further to the public and bind the Kennedys further to each other. They, they grew closer during the course of his presidency. I talked about the Cuban Missile Crisis. It says something about Jacqueline Kennedy, who spent much of his presidency outside of the White House, um, away from the prying eyes at the White House gates. But it says something about her that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, she and her children go back to the White House. She wants to be with him during these most desperate hours. And that speaks to the relationship they had, despite all the the womanizing and recklessness that we see from Jack Kennedy. She was there uh, in those moments, as you write, to make sure he was supported and that she was at his side. Uh, at um, You know, and also those those remarkable images of her after he was killed on the limousine. And I mean, she was clearly devastated by what had happened. Let's take a look at the image now. Uh, what is it that you like about this image? It's so powerful. I remember this one quite well. Well, we remember from the inauguration speech that uh, John F. Kennedy says the torch has been passed to a new generation. And this really uh, is, 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 amplifies that. You see the very young, vigorous Jack Kennedy uh, walking with the, uh, the aged uh, uh, stalwart uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the hero of D-Day from another generation. At 69, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was the oldest outgoing president that we had had in our history to that point. And at 43, John F. Kennedy was the youngest president elect. So the, the torch had indeed been passed to a new generation and it would stay with that generation, what we now call the, the greatest generation, those that fought on the front lines of World War II for 28 years, mm -hmm. right through the presidency of George Herbert Walker Bush. So this shows as much as anything that generational shift. Generational shift, and it, it seems to me that the early 60s were still very much like the 50s, like Eisenhower's time, that the 60s, uh, a, after JFK's death, this, the, the country really began to change culturally much more dramatically uh, than in those early days. There was still, Dwight Eisenhower, while it was a new generation of Americans, was still not completely out of step yet with where our, our culture was. Would you agree? Is that fair to say? That's exactly right. Uh, and John F. Kennedy not only represents a new generation, but represents a shift in our culture. 
uh, and he, he symbolizes the, the youthfulness and the, the vigorousness that we associate to a large degree with the 1960s and the major changes that we go through culturally and politically. There's a story uh, of, of, of Kennedy during the transition meeting with Eisenhower. Um, when Eisenhower is going through the trouble spots in the world, and there are many of them, including Vietnam, uh, and uh, Kennedy leaves that meeting uh, and gets into a limousine with an aide and, and says of Eisenhower, how can he stare in the face of disaster with such equanimity? <laughs> but it, it's, it's funny because it's equanimity that right. I think most characterizes um, John F. Kennedy in his most important hour as president in the, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He deals with that with a certain grace. Uh, John F. Kennedy quotes Ernest Hemingway uh, uh, and his definition of courage saying, courage is grace under pressure. And we see in Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, grace under pressure, the equanimity that he only imagined he could have in, as president when he had the transition meeting with Ike. Yeah, most presidents always seem to have their moment when they're tested, and certainly that was uh, his major one. Let's talk about this photo now, Mark. Well, that goes back to what we were talking about. This is the summit between John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna in June of 1961, and we talked about the disparity in their aesthetics. You had, you know, you had this, uh, uh, you know, little pugnacious five foot three Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, who had all the elegance of a rusted fire plug going up against this guy who looks like a leading Hollywood, you know, right. a, a Hollywood leading man. Uh, there was such disparity. And, and again, you see the grace of Jack Kennedy, but it did not translate into a successful summit with Nikita Khrushchev. And let's, if there's another photo, uh, let's move forward because I'd like to get through uh, all of the ones that we have uh, before we have run out of time. Mark, talk about this, if you would. Well, this is uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. There were a series of meetings that Kennedy has with the uh, executive committee, the XCOM, it's called. And Kennedy, again, keeps counsel very close during the Cuban Missile Crisis, during these extraordinarily tense days. And you can, you can uh, feel the tension mm -hmm. in this meeting as the, uh, Kennedy and his aides try to determine the best route out of the, the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right, and, and let's advance to the next picture. Oh, I like this one, I remember this. You know, this is uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, the president and vice president, meeting with the leaders of the, uh, the, the big five. These are all of the civil rights organizations, including the uh, SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, headed by Martin Luther King, that staged the March on Washington in August of 1963. That is, of course, where Martin Luther King gives perhaps the most stirring address of the the 20th century, his I have a dream speech. Mm -hmm. Kennedy does not attend the, uh, the, the, the march, but watches very carefully on television. And he sees Martin Luther King as he makes that speech. And he says a couple of times, he's damn good. Uh -huh. And when he receives uh, Martin Luther King at the White House, he shakes his hand and says, I have a dream. Wow. It's a wonderful moment. So that's yeah, wonderful. A, 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 and among the people in that picture, by the way, is a very young John Lewis. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure. Who, of course, became an icon. Uh, this is one of those great images as well. <laughs> and, and, and a great orator knows a great order, I guess, to go back to your point about uh, what Kennedy said about uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, tell us about this photo. Well, it's exactly what we were talking about before, Dan. You, you, you see a, a picture... Uh, offers a thousand words. There are at least a thousand words in this picture. You can yeah, see so Lyndon Johnson talking to John F. Kennedy. This is at the convention in Los Angeles, the Democratic National Convention in Los Angeles in 1960. But look at the contempt in Bobby Kennedy's eyes as he looks <laughs> at Lyndon Johnson. Um, Jack Kennedy is is not as contemptuous, but 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 uh, again, I think there was a there ended up being a. Um, uh, a, a, a relationship based on mutual respect between John Kennedy and, and Lyndon Johnson. And I think in many ways, the two have very complementary legacies. Mm -hmm. I don't think the legacy of Lyndon Johnson competes with, with that of John F. Kennedy. I think they complement uh, each other in, in very meaningful ways. Yeah, that's a great point. I've never thought about it that way, but I think you're right. Another great photo here, Mark. This is taken in August of, of 1963, just several months before John F. Kennedy was assassinated. This is the, the Kennedy family, the young Kennedy family at, at, um, uh, 
in, uh, on Cape Cod uh, in Hyannisport at the Kennedy compound. John F. Kennedy is on the phone doing the business of his presidency and Jackie is there with the family dogs and her children, John John and, and Caroline. This is just two weeks uh, after the loss of their third child, Patrick. I mentioned that that, that um, very tragic incident bound the Kennedys closer together. And I think when, they, when Kennedy is assassinated, their relationship is at a high point. And they're, they're, and next picture, they're, 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 they, they're, this was such a public family. You know, uh, we saw so many images in, uh, when they were in office. Uh, we really uh, shared in their children growing up and, and they were very much a public family. Absolutely. And, but Jacqueline Kennedy was a very reluctant public figure. Uh, she did not do this very happily. When John F. Kennedy went to Texas, and this, is, this shows them landing at Love Field on that very fateful trip to Texas, uh, Kennedy went to a number of different cities in Texas, Houston, San Antonio, um, Dallas, and he was supposed to come to Houston. He was in Fort Worth earlier this day, and he was supposed to go to Austin rather later that night and obviously would, would, would not make it. But uh, it was a big deal that Jacqueline Kennedy was with, uh, with her husband. She wanted to support him during what was a very important trip politically for John F. Kennedy. I mentioned he had proposed the Civil Rights Act of 1963. It did not make him particularly popular in Texas. So Kennedy goes to almost to go on the stump in advance of the midterm elections and to put some money into his campaign coffers. He was promised a million dollars if he were to go to, to Texas. That was big money in sure. those days. Uh, and so he does it uh, partly for those reasons. And Jackie, knowing the importance uh, of this trip for her husband, accompanies him. And that shows them as they get off the plane in Love Field, the, there had been rain, it had been a rainy day in Fort Worth and almost miraculously during the short hop uh, uh, by Air Force One from Fort Worth to Dallas, the sun clears and Kennedy orders that the top goes down on his limousine and, of course, is assassinated about a half an hour later. Fateful decision, obviously. And she may have been a reluctant uh, public figure, but it, it's, and I may be wrong, but you, uh, correct me, but this family, this presidential family, was really uh, the beginning of a more public uh, profile for presidential family. I don't recall a lot of images. Maybe there were some of, of Eisenhower, but FDR's family. I mean, this really was a new era in American politics, correct? I think that's right in so many respects, just as uh, John F. Kennedy played so well on television, so did Jacqueline Kennedy. She did a special where she took uh, a, a news crew through the White House, gave the American public essentially a tour, a televised tour of the White House which she had enhanced greatly by bringing in beautiful furniture and art and bringing culture into the, the White House. She wanted the White House to, to, to rival palaces across Europe, and she had the elegance and the style and the taste to do that very effectively. So the, the American people, um, overwhelmingly, 80% of the American people tune in to this televised special of Jacqueline Kennedy giving a tour of the White House. And you're right, I think the television age makes uh, the, the first family more prominent than it was. We had had Eleanor Roosevelt, who certainly enhances the role of first lady, but Jacqueline Kennedy does a great deal to enhance her, her husband's public image by mm -hmm. projecting her own very elegant image. You know, uh, thank you, Mark. In the, in the few minutes we have left, I, I want to uh, get to some of the questions from our audience. Uh, and this is a really interesting question. I want to kind of dovetail it with something else. During your research, did you learn or hear anything that surprised you about President Kennedy? And the companion question I'd ask on top of that is, describe the challenge in researching and writing about a president that has already been so heavily researched and written about. You know, I'll, ask the, uh, I'll answer the latter question first. I, I think you're right. There are many books that have been written about John F. Kennedy, um, and some of them very good. I guess I, I wrote the book that I wanted to read. I'd not read um, a book that really takes you briskly through the, the ups and downs and triumphs and tragedy and turbulence of, of the Kennedy presidency and makes you feel like you're in the moment with this, you know, this very human leader in John F. Kennedy with all his blemishes and all his great potential at the same time. Uh, that's what I wanted. And I wanted to cut through the Camelot myth 
uh, which has abounded, as you suggested earlier, Dan, uh, since Kennedy died. And that, that's what I tried to achieve with this. There is a great oral history that's been amassed at the Kennedy Library, and, and some of that material has not been used in books, and I gladly tapped into that to help to better tell this story. Um, so what, what, what most surprised me, I think is, um, I, I've spent a lot of my uh, uh, career around the, the legacy of Lyndon Johnson, who I consider the civil rights president for so many reasons. Mm -hmm. But I was, um, I, I was interested to know more about why Kennedy finally moved on civil rights when his consciousness was raised and he decided to put the weight of the presidency around civil rights. I talked about George Wallace stepping in, in the, the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama, but there was another thing and that was Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy had gone to, um, had asked a number of uh, intellectuals and entertainers in New York to talk to him about civil rights, including James Baldwin, the great novelist, and he asks Baldwin to put together this group. And Bobby Kennedy goes up and hosts them in his father's penthouse in Manhattan. And the, th this group of folks are not shy about telling Kennedy exactly how they feel. And it, it takes Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy by surprise tremendously. But he goes back to Washington chastened and humbled by what's he, what he hears. And he talks to his brother, and I think that makes a difference in his brother's view of the civil rights struggle too. And that leads to that speech that I talked about in June of 1963. Excellent, Pete. Uh, you know, if, if you, you put this great book out, um, is there a story that you wish you'd put in or that you've discovered since or one that you decided to exclude for, is there something else that that you learned that, uh, that maybe is not in this book that you'd like to share at this moment? You know, I tried to put everything I could into this, um, uh, Dan, and, and, and make it as uh, a friend of mine who read it said, my God, it reads like a novel. And that's exactly what I, I wanted. I wanted, it to does. Be, I wanted the reader to be as fascinated with the book as Americans and citizens of the world were with, with Jack Kennedy. I wanted to bring him to life in certain respects. So I didn't leave anything out, but I will tell you that I interviewed uh, Andrew Young, uh, the, the great civil rights leader, the uh, uh, an, an indispensable aide to Martin Luther King, almost Martin Luther King's chief of staff, his de facto chief of staff. And there was so much great material for that from that interview that I, I, I perhaps might have included if the book were a little longer, but I did get some great things from the, the great Andrew Young. Uh, well, I have to say, it does read like a novel. It's just a terrific read, Mark. And you, as I said at the top, you have interviewed seven presidents. I'd like now to give you the opportunity to interview the eighth. A member <laughs> of our audience will ask, is asking you, if you had the opportunity to ask President Kennedy one question, what would it have been? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure it would be one question, but I, but I, I would like to talk to him about what he was feeling during the course of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I talked about, crisis rather, I talked about that being perhaps the most dangerous moment in humankind because nuclear war was such a distinct possibility. But what we don't know, unless a president writes about it after he leaves office or, or talks about it, are his feelings when he's in the presidency. Presidents don't talk about their feelings. That's, we don't ask them to do that very often. Um, they're talking about the facts, they're, they're, they're raising our consciousness about their things, but they're not talking about how they feel at a particular moment. So how did Kennedy get through those moments? What are the, the things that he was doing personally at that time? What, what did his life look like during those 13 harrowing days as he is desperately trying to figure out a peaceful way out of what might possibly be nuclear annihilation? That would be a great thing to know because it, we can't even really conceive the kind of pressure on one person. Really the fate of certainly our country and, and the Soviet Union and, and maybe humanity was in the balance. And, and it, it's hard to even fathom how much pressure he was under on, on so many levels. That's Mark, exactly you have done just a brilliant uh, job with this book. Just brilliant. It's a fascinating read. And uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming on the program. We have reached a point where we uh, have uh, finished this great discussion on this book. I want to thank Mark Updegrove, the author of Incomparable Grace, JFK, 
in the presidency. I, I would highly encourage you to read it. It's just a terrific read. Please pick up a copy uh, at your local bookstore, wherever you buy books. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, uh, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. Mark up to Grove, uh, growth. Mark, thank you so much for coming on today. Dan, thanks so much for having me. It's a terrific conversation. Thank you. It was a great conversation and great job on this book. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we uh, look forward to uh, speaking with you again soon. Thanks. All right. I'm Dan Ashley, uh, ABC 7 News and Commonwealth Club Board of Directors. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.